Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 314, the pie episode for Tuesday, July 27th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here as a working musician in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Mr. Kent. Mr. Yes, Kent. Sir. How yes, are we sir. today? How are we today? Well, um, emotional weekend, emotional week last week. We, we played those last two gigs with Steve. Yeah. Uh, I think anyone of the listeners and several listeners are connected to me on social media. My puppy passed away this, uh, yesterday. And so, yeah. So, so that on top of, you know, kind of this roller coaster of emotions of of Steve moving away, it's, uh, you know, we go through these, we go through these moments in life where we have to deal with, especially as creative people, we we're like, what does this mean to me? You know, like, yeah, you know, how does this wash over me? And, you know, we feel these things deeply. But I did want to share with you, we had these last two gigs with uh, our 20-year bass player. And yeah. Friend and brother and confidant and, you know, yeah, barrister, you know. So, <laughs> um, so um, we the first gig was a, an outdoor gig. Uh, they, they were both outdoor gigs, but the first gig was a park, a concert in the park. Yep. Uh, I'll start by saying it was kind of nice because it's, it's a – a town, it's a series that usually does about eight or 10 of these and they only were going to do one and mm. they wanted us. They didn't just ask us, they wanted us. That's awesome. So it was an honor, you know, to kind of have that feeling. And it was actually, you know, it's an event that we have been a little bit on the fence um, just because the logistics are weird of it. We're, when we play, it's outside, we're in the shade, but yeah. there's a huge bright sunshine you know it starts at 6 30 so july august it's you know it's kind of high sun still yeah um and then people sit about 50 yards away from us in the shade so that they can too be in the shade yeah i've I've experienced this it's a weird thing like it totally makes sense except it's still weird yeah and it's hard and you know yeah you get some people out to dance and you know what you often get is little kids who wander up and parents chasing little kids and so it's always like a little bit removed from the audience well uh, the miracle of COVID in the two years since we played this gig last, the trees have grown and there was shade all <laughs> everywhere. Oh, so, really? so at just because people hadn't people hadn't been in the park for a couple of years. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, we didn't know that, that was what it was going to be. Of course, and, yeah. And so the dynamic that had changed at the angle of the sun was now hitting some taller trees, and oh. it was beautiful, beautiful night. So, oh, anyway, so this would have happened anyway. You just hadn't been there for a while, so you didn't expect it. I get it. Exactly. Now. I understand. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you know, we were kind of seeing that this might be possible when we set up. And so, again, you knock off, A, that they were so gracious and wanting us to play, B, that the thing that made this gig not – as fun in the past was now kind of evaporating. And then C, it was T minus two gigs with Steve. And so we get there. Um, I had taken our last official band pick and had it blown up for the guys to sign and put into a and put into a frame for Steve that we're going to give him later. And so, you know, we kind of had that going off on one side and guys moved in. It just felt like a nice night right from the beginning. Like everybody's vibe was in pointed in the right direction. Sound check went good. Bill, you know, had us ready to go. And, you know, it was just everything was going smooth. And then the gig just went freaking great. And so oh, that's good. it was good. The weird thing that happened, and again, I don't know if you ever found this, but so we're about, it, it was only a 90 minute gig, about two thirds of the way through, there's a guy on the side of the stage who's vehemently motioning for me he, he, me to come over uh, and we're in the middle of a song right oh, yeah. I mean, you ever have you ever have people who just are totally oblivious that in the middle of a song is not the time to talk to uh, uh, someone uh, absolutely a song? happened at the gaslight a couple of weeks ago it's like yeah weird i'm, I'm like i like the, the, like we're in the middle of a song i gotta go right now i got i got this thing i gotta do <laughs> yeah so anyway i go over because i i don't know if something's wrong or i don't of know, you know, I, you know just, so yeah. i just go over and I lean in and he goes he goes we want you to play another hour 
Oh gosh. And I'm, like, I'm like, it's not, it's not up to me. You know, like they, the town got, the city got permits. permits? And, you yeah. know, those people, he goes, he goes, there's no sheriffs here. What are they going to do? And I'm like, he wants to negotiate with me in the middle of a song. And then he goes, <laughs> He goes, I'll give you $500 to play another hour. And I said, that's very, like, again, while playing a song, that's very generous, but it's not our call on this. So I go to, I go to play and we finish. The guy later comes on stage, oh. puts $500 in my back pocket and whispers to me, I just put five hundred dollars in your back pocket. <laughs> we we're having a great time. They're only going to do one of these this year. We we really need this. Can you can you play on? And wow. I said, I will play as long as we can play. Right? Yeah. So, hey. So you know what? Sure. I guess. I mean, at that point, you are, you know, your eyes wide open on this, right? So there's some responsibility for you. But I mean, when the cops show up, you just stop. Like that's all. That's yeah. all that's going to happen. Yeah. Well, it, mostly I was just concerned. Again, there was an, an organization that organized this event right. and hired us. It's their call, right? Should be. So, you know, yeah. Anyway, he put the money. Um, <laughs> it uh, is flattering he, though. Like, I well, mean. So, yeah, it is flattering. But, you know, again, <laughs> motioning me over in the middle of a song, walking on stage. Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah. this was a person who doesn't take no, you know, clearly in his life. Anyway, right, right. I said, I said, well, we'll play as long as we possibly can. So uh, we finished, we finished technically our last song, maybe two songs later. The guy who hired us comes on. And he goes, anybody want an encore? And I said, can we can we go longer? He goes, yeah, you can go longer. Anyway, we end up, he didn't think we were going to go an hour longer. And so we go about 20 minutes longer. And then he comes up and says, we got we to gotta cut it off. So anyway, right. I ended up playing about 20 minutes after time. The guy comes up and he actually wasn't a dick about it. I mean, he was kind of looking at me like, you know what? And I said, dude, I, you know, you can have your money back. And he actually ended up giving me $200 for 20 minutes, you okay. know, longer. Right. Which is kind of cool. Sure. And that money, that money then went, and uh, we had planned after this gig, and again, great gig, great audience response. You know, the I would say the band has just about kicked into our pre-COVID level at this gig. Okay. Like, sure. We, yep. We were we were feeling it like that, and it was loose and fun and funny and and uh, and connected, and you know, and the band played great. Anyway, so then we take Steve out for his last night. Now. So this is after the second to last gig. We have another gig the next day. Right. We all are are fully aware that that this plan to take Steve out may <laughs> may, may reduce backfire. the last gig. Yes. Yeah, well, well, we knew this is a possibility, but but the next gig ended quite late, and we wouldn't be able to get you know anywhere in time to really sit down. So this gig ended early enough where we all went. I had invited a couple of Steve's friends from other groups that he played with. We ran into some people we know. Nice. Drinks were flowing. Tears started flowing. And it was, it was, it was a really nice night. I mean, there was all these acknowledgments. We told stories about his time in the band. It was, it was about a sweet uh, evening and he was touched and he's not a, you know, very emotional guy. And I could tell he was, he was starting to feel that loss, I guess, you know, of, of him walking away from something that he had put his heart and soul into for so long. So anyway, that's that night. Uh, I think it ended about, we probably got there about nine, maybe it ended around midnight. Yep. Uh, one more gig to do. And so we go, you know, the next gig, we show up around four 30. Everybody's good. Even he was good. He was, you know, drank a lot of Jägermeister yet. <laughs> he's, he's a, he's a freak of nature. And, uh, you know, he shows up spry Everybody was great. And then we play this gig that we've played for many years. It's kind of a, um, it's like a ticketed thing at a winery. And, uh, you know, okay. music in the vineyard at a, at a really nice winery called Fortino Winery. Beautiful stage. You know, they, they built this big event center that's primarily for weddings, but it's perfect for these types of events. Huge, yeah. you know, huge stage. And anyway, um, they sold 650 tickets. Um, it's one of those things when we pull up at about four o'clock, there are already people in line to, mm. you know, even though the doors weren't open and you just get a buzz from that, you know, the pe that, that, that awesome. people are so excited about it. You know, you just get a rise that everybody's going to be into it tonight. So, you know, there are probably 50 people in line when I got there, um, and the gates weren't open yet. So, um, yeah, and it's a ticket event, but you kind of walk in and claim your table. So that's why they're in line early. So, uh, right. Yeah, of course. Yep. Yep. So, first, anyway. come, first come, first serve is a is a nice thing in those scenarios. Yeah. For, exactly. for the band, not necessarily for the people attending. But, yep. Yep. And again, you know, we, it's one of those things where when you walk in and the sound is already set up and you literally don't have to lug anything, you know, you can just hear the sound systems tuned really nice, and, <laughs> you know, and you can just kind of lay into this soft velvet glove of, of a, of a well-prepared stage. Yeah. 
that's what it was like. So again, everything's kind of going our way. No, no weird problems to solve. Everybody's on time. You know, all the little things that lead you into a stress-free gig. Yep. And lots of fans out to say goodbye to Steve. Um, you know, like I said, 650 tickets is a sellout for that place. And, and, uh, the band was just monstrous from down. Oh, that's on. great. And as the night goes on and we can all kind of feel where we're going. And I, I made one public announcement about it being Steve's last gig with us early in the gig. And then I kind of did a, a, a little deeper dive when I did the band introductions that kind of got everything going, uh, you know, emotionally on stage, yeah. but instead of emotionally weird and sad, um, it was just like everybody like, we're going to take this last quarter of the show as far as we can freaking go. And the band was just on fire. The horns were, I, I'm going to talk about the horns in a second, but the horns were, they always play great, but they were fun. They, they, yep. Like yep. The, even the guys who live in a shell came out of their shell. They were all over the stage. Mendoza, who's a great, my, my tenor sax player, who's a great entertainer anyway, he's hopping across the front of the stage. And, you know, just, there was a vibe of, like craziness that is actually my dream of how the band should be every night. Um, uh, Steve, who's, you know, famous for playing with no shoes on. Right. We played the last couple songs. Everybody in the band took off their shoes. That's the only way to play, by the way. Uh, <laughs> just saying like Steve, Steve has been right all these years and it was nice <laughs> that you guys finally caught up to him. So, yeah. And he That's actually good. said that of all the of all the things we've done to pay tribute to him, that actually meant the most to him. So, <laughs> uh, and again, it was just one of those things. You know, like when your band hits the potential that you, as a leader, or even if you as just as a bandmate, yeah, that you have, it is such an amazing feeling. I mean, literally, like you, generally, you play with guys and you know they they can play, right? But it's and you know you have nights where you blow away the audience you have nights when you're good with the audience and you know but when your whole band like nobody's talking each over over each other on the mic yep. uh you know it just just everything kind of clicks we had, we I had think a night that's why we do what we do right in in quest yeah of those nights. oh no you right you you want those moments that's the beauty of live performance i i also love the moments where there's a mistake and everybody sort of has to come together non-verbally usually to remedy it right like that those are those are for a very different reason those are also fun moments because i i like that non-verbal communication that that has to happen but it's even better when it's happening for the reason you described we had a gig like that our first gig at broadway studios with the macworld all-star band had that vibe going on where everybody mm -hmm. on stage was there to impress everybody else on stage it was it was a competition, but not really. It was more like, oh, well, he brought his A game. So now I got to bring my A game. And it really, the whole band just lifted up with that. And and the crowd knows it too when that's happening. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. We actually, we had that, um, our Bitter Pill gig on Saturday. We played at this, uh, at, at this place called Eastman's Farm where we played before. It's an outdoor thing. Same kind of thing. We get there. There's already people, you know, seated at tables waiting for us to start. And uh, and we got good sound going. And then, like, things we we just – we actually had a, a sort of a weird start to the gig. It, it was as though we hadn't uh, played for many weeks, even though it had been only, like, whatever, six days since the last gig we played. <laughs> there, were, there were some interesting little foobars um, early on. We just weren't locked in. But then – Suddenly we were locked in uh, for the end of the first set and and certainly for the entirety of the second set. And it was just it was the first time for me that I felt like everybody in the band was interacting with everybody else in the band. It, it was we were moving as one as opposed yeah. to, uh, you know, each person doing their thing and occasionally two or three or sometimes four are locked in. It was just everybody was there and aware of what everybody else was doing all the time. And it, it it's a, that's a magical thing uh, when when that can happen. And of course, we get to the end of the gig and, and you know, my feeling is, OK. And I, I talked to Billy afterwards and he was feeling the same way. He's like, yeah, oh, yeah, we slayed it. He's like, it, we really were moving as one. He, and it's like. But it still wasn't good enough. I'm like, oh, absolutely. Mm. Like it always can be better, right? Like yeah, there's always there's always more to go. And but being excited about that, where you know, you leave every gig, you leave thinking there's more to do. 
if you made a bunch of mistakes and that's the reason you're thinking that that can be a little bit, you know, a little dejecting, right? Like, oh man, we got so much work. But to also do. fixable. But fixable, right? But, but yes, true, fair. But when it's great and you know, oh wow, like now look at all that we could still do. That's even more exciting to me. It's like okay, like this band's really moving. Like I said, we moved as one uh, for the yeah, entire. Russ, game. my my drummer Russ, he likes to just drop, like whenever we talk about striving for that or yeah. whether when we talk about thinking we've achieved it he just will drop one heartbeat that's the only thing he'll say one heartbeat yep and so yeah that's, that's it uh, it's one yep that's right yeah where everybody's just breathing together and moving together and and like you said even the banter between songs is just flows and is smooth and yeah. it, it and, it's, and is organic and is organic and it it like the same I've always said one of my favorite things about band rehearsal, but it can, and for us in Bitter Pill, it certainly did happen on stage on, on Saturday, is that, you know, you get to rehearsal, and this can happen throughout rehearsal, but it certainly happens at the beginning. You get to rehearsal, everybody's setting up, and there's a, a conversation happening. You're chit-chatting, right? And then everybody's, like, turning on their instruments and getting things going. And often, not always, but but often, at some point, the band just sort of slips into playing something. Without anybody saying, okay, now we shall stop talking and we shall start playing. Sometimes that happens. But most of the time what happens is the, the conversation keeps going. It just changes from being a verbal conversation to being a musical conversation. And I, I love that transition uh, when mm. that can happen. And it, it happened several times on stage on Saturday. And I was just like, okay, this is bliss right here. When, when it just is all the same. Uh, that to me well, is great. No, I get it. And actually you, you, you kind of bring up a, a fun, fun thought. So uh, one of my live music, semi-professional weekend warrior pet peeves, more than iPads and more than cargo shorts would be when bands have to look around, say ready, you know, before yeah. <laughs> many songs, right? Yeah. That just bugs the living heck out of me. And, you know, I think that that's a kind of a default position in many bands and a lot of, in a lot of things, but I just kind of, it just feels like, how could you not be ready? So, you know, my, my mantra to the band, even the guys who have to change pages on their charts or change mm. patches and their stuff is we're, we're playing ready golf here. Like, you know, you, you need to be ready one song to the next. And if something is going on that can keep you, you, you know, you need to find a way. You got to alert you know, somebody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in, in a professional way. Right. That's Not right. like how, how dare you start the song without looking me in the eye and confirming that I'm ready to right. give you my services. No, it's on you as the musician. I had that early on, on Saturday. I, you know, there, there's a lot to do when you get to a gig, especially when you're doing your own sound, which we were, we got the sound all set up. Everything was good. We had extra time. The one thing I didn't do was check the tuning on all my drums. Uh, and we start the gig with me on Cajon. Usually that's how the bitter pill shows start. Uh, we play a couple of songs that way. And then I drop onto the set and we go right into uh, a song that I play on, on full drums. And so I count that in and I realize, Oh wow. My snare drum is like, like the heat, uh, you know, the temperature throughout the week has dropped this thing so mm -hmm. far. And it's like, Oh crap. Like, yep. I need, like I went through everything except that, you know? And so in, I think I played two songs that way. And then Billy started talking to the crowd and it was like, okay, here's my moment. And I started doing it and he went to count in the next tune. And I had to be like, wait, 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 give me, you know, another 10 seconds here to get this right. And he's like, oh, okay. But, but you know, to your point, it was on me to stop the flow when I, and to pay attention to the flow too. Right. Like yeah. if I can sneak things in while they're chit chatting all the better, but when I realized that was not going to happen, I had to, you know, stop what I was doing and pump the brakes in yeah. order to, in order to keep things flowing. But, but it like a hundred percent on me, like I should have done it before the gig, but you know, stuff happens, right? Stuff um, happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I have so a question that, for you. Yeah. So Billy, the leader of Bitter Pill, right? Fair. He's the leader of Bitter Pill. Sure. Yeah. All right. He would he, never, um, I don't think he would ever call himself the leader of Bitter Pill, but. Um, how, about, he, how about founder of Bitter Pill? He's yes, he's the founder. He's definitely the manager of Bitter Pill. I I, okay. I think of him as the leader of Bitter Pill, but I, I think he would probably disagree with that. It's a band, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my question is, his 
I think when we first you first started talking about him, it, it was because of musical theater projects, right? Correct. Yeah, that's how I met right, Billy. So yeah, he was he was the male lead. He played Dan in the first production of Next to Normal that I did seven or eight years ago, and that's how we met. Got it. So my question is: Is Billy with these serious musical theater chops? Does his perspective, that perspective, inform the flow of your show? Oh, everybody in in Bitter Pill has been involved in theater at some level. Um, so it, yes, absolutely. I mean, right. It's theater. What, what a musical performance, even a band on stage is, is a theatrical performance, right? Mm -hmm. It just depends on whether, how aware everyone on stage is of that fact. Right. And in bitter pill, everyone is fully aware of that fact. Yeah. Got I mean, it. we start the show with Tomer doing, a. Uh, a. Uh, 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 a bit of the tempest for, uh, from Shakespeare. Like that's mm -hmm. generally how the show starts. And then, uh, and then we, and then we launch into a couple of, uh, of traditional tunes from there and then, and then back into our originals and stuff. But, um, but yeah, no theater is, is very much a part of what, of what we know bitter pill is. Yes. Got it. Yeah. 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 So, you know, the concept of flow and song to song and all these types of things, do, do does, and actually, more than just Billy, if you're saying that the whole band has got this experience, does that inform the way you approach flow different than, say, fling? You know, like, you know what you know, but, I, and I go back to this thing about many bands, you know, have to look around, ready, ready, ready? You know, some guys tuning, yeah. some guys tight, tightening, some guys, you know, talking to someone. This seems to be a common thing with, with uh semi-professional bands, they may have sections of their show that have some flow, but overall there are large sections of the show where if there's dead space between, you know, this is, uh, causes a rift of, uh, predictable and unpredictable things. Like some uh, people are very, like, I, I am not like, if we just play three great tunes together yeah. straight through almost a medley, but you know, but they run sure. each other. I am fine with 30 or 45 seconds of silence as yeah. we, you know, take a breath, get a glass of water. And, you know, silence, I don't feel that silence is okay. Silence is, yeah. Like, that's not, that's not a bad thing. It's just, I, I think it, I, I think where it's bad is when you're not aware of what you're delivering to the crowd at all times, but, but delivering silence and being aware and intentional of it is totally fine. I mean, everybody needs a moment to breathe. Right. And, and so giving the crowd that moment at the right times can, can be a, a very good thing for the show. It can, it can give you that flow uh, back yeah. and forth of things. So yeah, no, I don't, I don't have a problem with silence. Fling is a um, fling is fling are no strangers to, to musical theater, at least not, not all of us. Um, Russ. So the reason that I did bitter, uh, the reason that I did, well, yes, bitter pill, but the reason that I met Billy and, and wound up doing next to normal, whatever that was seven or eight years ago is because the female lead in that was Russ's wife, Lynette Russ from fling and Russ and Lynette produced that performance of, um, of next to normal and mm -hmm. asked me to be involved. Uh, I, <laughs> I was sold a bill of goods. Lynette was like, oh yeah, it's just a rock musical. You'd be fine with it. I'm like, oh great. And then I get the book and I realize, oh, it's like the hardest rock musical on drums that exists. Cool. Great. First time in 20 years reading music. This is, this is perfect. Um, but you know, so Russ, Russ has always been very aware of the theatrics of things and making sure that, you know, like endings of songs are, are a great example of, you know, how theatrical your band is. Do you, do you think about endings of songs? Do you mm. intentionally put a button on some song so that not every song is a button, meaning you know, you're ending hard on a note and there's no like, just like lingering crash, rumbly, whatever, you know, like the, the song truly has an end. Putting buttons on songs can really make a difference in your set. Um, yep. and, and so, you, you know, it, it was funny. We, um, in fling, we cover pinball wizard. And we put a button on that. It's very theatrical ending, right? We actually sing a, a, a third chorus that's not in the Who's version. And then we have a one measure sort of build. And then we hit a button and it is, it is tight and out. And when I wound up doing that song with the cabaret for New Year's Eve or whatever with a bunch of theater people, I sang it. And I said, oh, let's just end it this way. And 
as soon as I explained it to them, they're like, oh, that's a perfect little theater ending. I'm like, actually, that's true. Never really thought about it that way. But yes, you're right. And it, and it very much was intentionally built that way. Russ was like, no, it's, we got to put a button on it. And I remember the conversation where a couple of guys in the band are like, no, big rock ending. And he's like, no, we got to have some songs that have, you know, a tight ending. And so... So Fling has some of that, but we also have some of the, you know, deer in the headlights moments with, with a few of us occasionally on stage. And it's like, I mean, I know what you're talking about. It happens. Yeah. Yep. But, but it is a theatrical thing. Like you are, it, it, you know, it's a visual art and, and it's a real time art. So you have to manage that time. Cause if you don't, no one will. Uh, or people will, and then they'll lose interest in you if they are left to manage their own time all the time. So, well, this again is is democracies on versus off stage, and and you know a front person's role. Yeah, and how a band handles the approach to that, right? So, so you know, I don't think band any band always, succeeds as a as a democracy on stage. I'm, I w- I would tend to agree with that, but yeah. you know, but whether it's implicit or Explicit. expressed sure. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so you know in my band you know it's always been the same and the guys we don't generally have the problem of a guy saying some random thing on mic because they see someone they know in the, in the audience type of thing right sure. it, it's uh you know whether by design or whether you know by good fortune or good training you know our guys are pretty focused we go we pretty much go song to song to song Space in between songs, they know that I'm, I may or may not. And so that's a place where the follow the leader is a really, you know, that's, that's part of my creative joy of like, you know, conducting the flow yeah, of these things, for right? For sure. Somebody needs to. Yeah, somebody, somebody. needs to be the, the conductor. I mean, you can have different people count off different songs or whatever, and that's fine as long as everybody's aware of how that might work. But, right. but they're, especially when there's, you need to have a default conductor uh, of of the flow of the evening, even if that person's not necessarily the conductor of the band, right? Mm-hmm. It, somebody needs to to lead the evening, yeah, and that's that's the front person, whoever that might be. And and I've seen it, uh, like I've seen wedding bands where the leader on stage is someone that the crowd probably doesn't even notice. I remember watching at my brother-in-law's wedding, the bass player was clearly the leader of the band. He, he had a mic set up in front of him, just like everybody, but I never heard what he said into that microphone. He was yeah. talking into that mic, into everybody's ears all night. Yeah, And it was like, you could see as one song was coming to an end, he'd just go up to the mic while they're all still playing. Or maybe during the rumbly ending of a song, if in fact that song had that kind of thing, and he would, you know, announce whatever was going to happen next. I don't know if they had a set list or not. It didn't really matter. The show flowed, and that's all that mattered, you know. And uh, and he he conducted that band stealthily. Uh, it took me a little while to figure out what was happening. Like, you know, it wasn't it wasn't obvious out of the gate. It was like this is interesting. This band's really well oiled. They're just moving without even communicating. I was like, ah, oh, no, wait, 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> There's communication happening. It's yeah. that dude. He, he's just, stealthy. yeah, he's just stealthy about it. He wasn't a performer in a, in a, you know, animated sense. Uh, he, he was a performer in that he played the bass lines real well, but you know, it, 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 you can certainly have the persona of a bass player that is, you know, almost wallpaper, right? The guy that's just holding it down and being real steady Eddie and, and doesn't need to be the flamboyant front person. Cause there's four other people on stage filling that, that visual space. Right. And so he was just there doing his thing. And then finally it was like, Oh, wait, 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 he's doing mm-hmm. more. I see. Yeah. This is interesting. And then for a long time, all I did was watch him because it was interesting seeing how he did stuff. But yeah, no, I think you got to have somebody like that, that everybody falls to as a default. You know, it can certainly it like in that band, if, if one of the front people saw something happening in the crowd that they wanted to react to, my guess is, my guess is that that happened throughout the night and the band followed them as they should, but, yeah. but you know, that bass player was the fallback in any given moment. If, if, if there wasn't anything happening, he needed to make it happen. And he did, For you sure. know, so, um, I want to, so yeah, so it's interesting. I think, I think about that a lot that, you know, how uh, theater chops are, are good in a rock band. I think it's, I think it's important. I also think about in years a lot and I want to tell people <laughs> about, well, I do. It's true. And I actually have some things to say about that, but in the inordinate amount, what's that? 
An inordinate amount. An inordinate amount. It's true. And and I'm happy that our sponsor this week makes it really easy for me because I love talking about in-ears and Ultimate Ears Pro is our sponsor again this week. I'm super happy to have them. And what I'm really happy about is that to celebrate the return of live music, Ultimate Ears is offering you, Gig Gab listener, 20% off of any UE Pro in-ear monitors from the UE7 and up. 20% off with coupon code GIGGAB20. So that's G-I-G-G-A-B-2-0. This is only good for a few weeks here. So get on this. I tested it. It works. The coupon actually applies. Like, not that I thought it wouldn't, but we always test these things for you before we tell you about them. And it was just, I, I guess the reason I'm saying is it's amazing to see that kind of a discount on Ultimate Ears Pro stuff because I'm not used to seeing that when I go and like shop for things there, they've got, you know, both Paul and I, we both use the, the ultimate ears. You use the UE sevens. I use the UE 11s. If I, if I've got that wrong, tell me, um, they, they, they stand by their stuff. It's been, I used the UE sevens, uh, up until I got the UE 11s, maybe four years ago or something. And it's, they've been fantastic, uh, throughout the years. And I'm, I'm blown away by the quality uh, they make it really easy to get things serviced. In fact, I just sent in my UE 11s for service, uh, which they'll take care of for me for 99 bucks because that's how they do everything there. And now what they have that they didn't have when I got mine, but now they've got the UE switch interchangeable face plates so that you can change the way your ears look without having to like send them in to UE. You can, you can get interchangeable face plates and put them on. You can have different ones on each ear or mix and match to whatever your outfit is. We're talking about being theatrical. We talked a couple of weeks ago about your costume. Well, your in-ears become part of your costume as well they should. And the UE switch can do that. But for now, please remember, go to pro.ultimateears.com and use our code GIGGAB20, GIGGAB20, to get 20% off UE Pro in-ear monitors from UE7 Pro and up. And our thanks to Ultimate Ears for sponsoring this episode. Paul, the next thing that I'm excited about is uh, one of the movies that I saw during South by Southwest, the Under the Volcano movie about George Martin's Air Studios down in Montserrat. Uh, that movie is something y'all are going to be able to watch in just a few weeks. Um, it, in fact, you got to order your ears before you watch this movie because I, I this movie comes out on August 17th on streaming services. And I, I think the ears deal ends right about that time. So order your ears. Make sure before you can watch this movie. But it, they say it's going to be out on uh, on streaming services. Uh, you know, they, they aren't clear which streaming services, but they are very clear that on August 17th, it will be available on some of them. And it seems like perhaps more than more than just a couple. So um, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to my review of it yeah. from back when 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 I watched it in March. But it, that was a great movie. And in fact, I didn't get to watch the end of it. I'm really looking forward because I had a gig that afternoon and I, it was a limited viewing window. I got to go to South by Southwest from my living room, but they gave us limited viewing windows for these things. And, um, I had to leave with about 15 minutes left, uh, in the movie. So, uh, I did not get to see the end of it. It may or may not have played in my living room. My wife, my wife may or may not have watched it. I don't know. Uh, I wasn't here to control that, but, um, but now I get to watch it on August 17th. So, uh, well, probably not the 17th cause it's a very special birthday in our house that day. So, um, and if I share whose it is, I'll probably have to move. <laughs> so, uh, I might watch it on the 18th or the 19th, but certainly by that weekend, I will be watching the end of under the volcano. Um, yeah. But great movie. I love movies like that. But it, this is the one that had, you know, Sting and Dire Straits and Paul McCartney and the Rolling Stones recorded Steel Wheels there. They were the last band to record there before the hurricane came in and, and took it mm. out. Uh, Elton John was there. Duran Duran, obviously George Martin's in the movie quite a bit. Giles Martin was interviewed for the movie. Um, George's wife was in the Giles' mother was in the movie. I, th I, I think that was the right person. I'm getting that right. I don't know. Uh, but uh, but yeah, great movie. Uh, so the police, I think I said the police. So anyway, yeah, cool. Um, there's another thing to watch, Paul, and that is McCartney Great. three, two, one. You've oh seen this gosh. heaven, absolute heaven. Yeah. I, um, I shared the story, I think on this, of the tour that my family got to do of, um, the love theater 
here in, in the United States in Las Vegas. And as part of that tour, they let us go into the studio there, which they call Abbey road West. They call ARW because it was sort of the mixing room was built to be very much like studio two. Um, and while we were in there, they, the engineer was like, well, you've heard the, the raw tracks, right? And I'm like, no, he's like, Oh, you're a friend of Giles. Like, of, of course I assumed you had I'm like, no, we don't like, we don't sit around. He doesn't have these on his phone, at least not from what he tells me, you know, and with it, without breaking, without even a breath, suddenly we were hearing like the isolated harmony tracks from, uh, from something. And, and it, it, it was, it was a very emotional reaction for all four of us in the family. We, it's a, a thing we'll never forget. I, I, I'm pretty sure all four of us were in tears like instantly. Mm. And there are many moments like that in this McCartney three, two, one, where they're just talking Absolutely. about a song and Rick Rubin, it's just Rick Rubin and Paul McCartney and Rick Rubin will just like bring up a track or McCartney will. And suddenly you're just in the middle of this, but hearing you know, either something isolated or something highlighted that a mix that you have never heard before. And it's just the two of them playing in there saying, Oh, check out this and check out that. And there's many of those moments where it just shocks me. Like, well, oh. for those who haven't seen it or don't know. So the premise of the whole thing is just a, ca a conversation between Rick Rubin and McCartney mm -hmm. often over a, a console. It looks like to be a very old console. Um, where uh, they are adjusting tracks. Now, to me, as I was listening to it, even when they were just like previewing a song, the mix sounded different to me. I was hearing different oh, yeah. things, than I did, right? So, yeah. but then the point is they kind of get into a song and he'll just play the bass line, but not only the bass line. I mean, certainly they talk a lot about Paul's bass playing, but, um, you know, they'll highlight some vocals. There was even one, did you see the one yet where... Um, McCartney has a horrible, horrible high yes. vocal. And they, yes. yeah, and he just cringes it. He goes, you had to do that, huh? So um, <laughs> I, I'll tell you, and there's just a charm to the flow of the conversation. I mean, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know that Ruben was the only guy who could have done this. I mean, he's, you know, he's a little bit wide eyed about this and he certainly has the cred, but I mean, he doesn't necessarily add a whole lot to the conversation. You know, no, he prods McCartney along and, and he is. He is a good foil for McCartney. He's such a Rick Rubin has such a warm personality yeah. that it it allows the little kid that still is very much alive inside of Paul McCartney to just blossom. And 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 so for that reason, I'm glad they got Rick Rubin. <clears throat> You're right. Other well, people certainly could have. But yeah. And the, the deal is what you just said, you know. Uh, you know, we haven't, you know, McCartney has never not been around really in modern memory. He, you know, he never really disappears, right? He, no. he puts out new music, you know, he, he sits in with some famous band somewhere. I mean, he's just kind of been around. I, my wife put it really well. I, I said, I'm watching this and I'm just enamored with it. And I said, you know, McCartney really seems like the type of guy you would love to have a, and I'm about to say beer with. And she goes, a bagel with And I was like, yes. You would sit down with Paul on a Sunday morning yep. and just have the most beautiful conversation. Uh, my friend James Schoolis, a musician I met down here, he summed it up really quite well in that he said, McCartney knows who he is. He knows what he's contributed. He genuinely is a fan of, of the Beatles now. And yeah. he says this many times. But I think this concept of he has a very McCartney-like way of... He never says we were the greatest band. You know, he, there's never anything overly boastful about it. No, but, but he doesn't a hide. The, like we were the Beatles, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. He it, doesn't hide the it's fact. Delivered that, in, it's delivered in such a way that makes you go, holy crap. And then, you know. He's always also, been OK. The, the way I've thought of it, whenever I see him and this, this this epitomizes it, is that he is very comfortable being Paul McCartney. Yeah. And all and he and he like eyes wide open. He understands who that is, the the persona, Paul McCartney, he's fully aware of what that means to the world and all of this. And he's totally OK with it. Like, he, he, you know, some people might call it a little egotistical at times because he's not humble, um, but that's OK. He, like, there's no reason for him to be humble. He's not a dick about it either. He's just like, but that's yeah, the thing. There's yeah. in no way. Could you say he's a dick about no, it? No, never like once. But he, he, he acknowledges exactly who he is and what he's accomplished 
and also acknowledges the mistakes that he's made. Like you said, when they, they bring up that, that one vocal where he just like goes for a note and this is on the record too. Like this wasn't yeah. a buried, I mean, it was buried in the mix, but it was not muted. I don't think it's there. And he's yeah. like, Oh gosh. He's yeah. like, yeah, we didn't always get it right. Did we, you know, a good example of this, uh, of he, he, they're talking about that, that, um, symphonic build in a day in the life. Right. Yeah. And how, you know, he just said, start at your lowest note and go to your highest note. And all these trained musicians were like, but where's the chart? You know, <laughs> like, like, you know, I, we don't do it that way. And, um, and Ruben asked him, you know, what was that like? You know, he goes, yeah, the engineers were like, what, what are you doing? And he goes, well, you know, he didn't say we were the Beatles. He was like, you know, after the amount of success that we had, we had the freedom to kind of push people to think out of the box. Yeah. And, you know, and he talked about how, uh, you know, they never wanted to be bored. That was one of the main things that, that spurred the innovation that they have. And I got to say, watching, I, there's six episodes and I finished it last week. And listening, especially listening on the multitracks as they're riding the faders and bringing out some of the little things that you don't hear, you know, all that well in other things, right? In, in the standard mix, you know, you yeah. really get a perspective on these types of things. It really is, you know, a karmic convergence of magic. I mean, that these four kids from this working class town were able to, you know, and again, certainly Martin did a oh. lot with him. And he, he acknowledges it very explicitly. Oh yeah. He, he acknowledges yeah. a lot of this stuff. A lot he of acknowledges, it. He acknowledges the stuff that different people play different instruments on, you know, in different tracks, yeah. you know, McCart but he says it kind of matter of factly, not. He's he matter of fact about, about it. That's what it is. He's not dickish. He's not humble. He's just matter of fact about it. That's right. He's talking. Yeah. He's talking about, um, I think he's talking about Lady Madonna. I think that's the one. And he's talking about that, how that was a little beyond his piano chops. And, and yeah. I think that's the one where he said George Martin played. And he goes, you know, I, I can, I can get some chords out, but you know, you know, that, that type of playing is. I think he my... played Lady Madonna. It, it, I think it was a different tune. Cause he played Lady did, Madonna. Did you see that episode? I did. Yeah. And what surprised me was when I toured Abbey road, the, 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 the actual, you know, EMI studios, uh, Giles had told me that the Mrs. Mills piano was not used for um, for Lady Madonna, that it was only obla di obla da. But, but in this, McCartney was pretty darn certain uh, or yeah. pretty darn confident in saying that it was the Mrs. Mills piano he also played for Lady Madonna. And it's what sort of inspired him to take on that character of the, the person singing about Lady Madonna, which yeah. I found – I mean, of course, it, like – I'm going to, I'm going to take McCartney's word for it more than Giles. Cause Giles, I don't even know if he was born yet, but he certainly born, wasn't yeah. there. Yeah. You know, like he just, he goes on what, what he's heard, you know, and, and what he knows. So it, it was, um, yeah, there were three, three moments in this that I, I don't want to spoil, but I will share so that those of you either that have seen it or when you see it, um, maybe you'll, you'll remember one is the origin of the name Sergeant Pepper. Uh, the second was a video of Jimi Hendrix that I did not mm. know existed. Yeah. I had heard the story of this video many times, but I did not know the video existed. And it like, as soon as the video came on, it, it again was one of those moments where it was like, whoa. And then I, I, I've only seen half of it. There's six episodes. I think I've seen three. Uh, there is a video of the recording of yesterday. And, um, th there's, th I had always made an assumption about what was being played there. Uh, again, I don't want to spoil it too much, but I, I guess there's, there's, there's something that sounds like a click track in yesterday and, and it's worth watching to, to get some clarity on that. Cause that was another moment where, you know, it was, it was my wife, daughter and I that were watching and we stopped and we had to rewind. We're like, wait a minute. What? Yeah. What? You know, and it, it was, it's just, there's so much, I, the fact that these, that these moments were videotaped is blows me away. Sure. Um, the fact that I get to see them is even better, but <laughs> I just didn't expect that, you know, there were video cameras in the studio with the Beatles, but, but in retrospect, of course, you know, of course there were. So, but you know, the thing about watching McCartney and watching him talk about these things and watching him play, you know, like play yesterday and, yeah. you know, um, he makes genius look so effortless. He never <laughs> looks like he's working. And I like I said, these, these remarkable things are happening. These remarkable words are coming out of his mouth. These remarkable tones are coming out of his bass. Bass lines are coming out of his bass. You know, it is, it is really, I think, 
And, and actually, let me sum it up this way. You know, you hear the Rolling Stones and you hear a rock and roll band. You hear, you know, two guitars, bass, and drums. Mm-hmm. Generally, on Beatles records, certainly many of the later Beatles records, you hear a lot of stuff. You know, you, you yeah, just there's hear, a lot more orchestral uh, you know, you hear styles, you yeah. hear, you hear departures, you hear, you know, a lot of different types of things. And, but one of the real gifts of this show, and it's also very fun because he talks about what it was like to play in the cavern six days a week, six hours a night, and, you know, talks about what it was like in, in Germany. Um, you actually see that, and it's the thing that kind of gives you hope as a musician is like when you break it all down, yeah, you know George Martin knew how to how to orchestrate and and arrange a, a symphony or or a or a quartet, but at the end of the day, it was it was just guys with musical ideas that, you know, together they turned them into magic and bigger yeah. than life things. But it was a band at the at the they were a band. I, yeah, that's the thing that gives me hope. Is like even yeah. these remarkable, incredible ideas start out with a couple of I, you know. I don't, you can have your opinion about whether Lennon was the level of genius that McCartney was, or, you know, it, it, people will feel different ways about it. But at the end of the day, they, he talked very candidly in several episodes. Yeah, we just brought in an idea and we started going with it. And, you know, this is where it ended up. Yeah. What did he, what did he say at one moment? He said, um, we wrote memorable songs because we had to remember them. We didn't have four tracks at home right. or anything. And it's just like, it, 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 but that's the matter of factness about it. Like it, it, not knowing any better that's what they created. <laughs> right? sure. they, they didn't know how how difficult many others would how, how difficult yeah. it was supposed to be, how difficult everybody else was going to find it to write number one hit after number one hit after number one hit. You know, it was just like, uh, yeah, there's so much stuff in there. It's great. It's great. I, yeah. I, I highly recommend it. It's on Hulu. I highly recommend it. It's yeah. great. Um, it, it's humbling. It's yeah. inspiring. It, it makes you feel good. He's just such the real deal. And, and uh, you probably haven't gotten to this yet, but um, um, he had said, oh, what was that last quote that he said? I'll have to, I'll have to watch it and find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I'm, I'm senior momenting here because of all the grief I've had to put up with. You've had a lot weekend. going on. <laughs> hey, I got a lot going on, man. I've, speaking of the Beatles, I have um, recently come across a n- new-ish band that I wanted to tell people about. It's called the Claypool Lennon Delirium. And it's Sean Lennon and Les Claypool uh, with a band. Uh, that hurts my head just to think about. You know what? It's 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 um, it's the the way I can describe it is it's like the Beatles stopped at Strawberry Field and took a left turn, like straight down the path of what was going to become prog rock, right? Mm. Uh, and it, and it like there's a lot of discussion that could be had about you know were the Beatles the originators of prog rock at at at, at, at moments in their career and and that be that as it may th- this sounds like the Beatles taking a left turn at at Strawberry Field and becoming like a a prog rock band with as much Pink Floyd Gentle Giant element as there is like the heavier like rush and and those sorts of things mixed in and and there Mm -hmm. are some there are some very good moments on uh what's the latest record of theirs called south of reality that's the one i've been listening to a friend of mine turned me onto it so i'll just i'll share that and uh and we'll we'll go from there i i did want to share one other thing because i like talking about in-ears paul if I if I may, <laughs> Fling has been, um, I believe, the last four rehearsals that we've done. Everybody in the band has been on in ears, and so much so that the only sound you would hear in the studio if you were here is drums and vocals. And it's really been interesting. the The first thing I noticed was how much less fatigued we were as a band after we normally rehearse about two and a half hours. Let's say we went three and a half hours the first night that everybody was on ears and we weren't using speakers at all. And, and we were all still energetic and that has remained um, since that first time. It it's, it's amazing how much, especially the low end, I think of the bass winds up fatiguing the human body. Just that, you know, that, that constant low frequency sound, um, was really, it's really interesting. Um, mm. but, but of course the mix, everybody has a super clean mix. 
Um, everybody's learning to figure out the way most people and Aaron and, and of course I have been using in ears for years. Uh, the rest of the band is brand new to this. And, uh, and so they're, you know, they're, they're figuring it out. They're figuring out where they want their mix. Uh, the guitar players are both using a variety of different, um, the amp simulators. Russ got one of those Strymon. What was the one? What was the Strymon pedal that that you were talking about? The one that's an amp simulator. Yeah, 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 yeah. The uh, the uh, I know Iridium. The Iridium. Thank you. So Russ has the Iridium, which works out great. Mike has been going through a few different things, but he one of the things the first thing he tried was that Joyo American pedal, which which simulates a Fender amp. And yeah. I'll tell you what, man, for forty bucks. I'm going to buy one of those and put it in my security blanket box and take it to gigs for if somebody ever, die, you know, if somebody ever has an amp die, you can just run it through the Joyo has like 50 pedals. I, I have the um, Vox one. That, okay. I mean, yeah. You know, go back to that conversation about how yeah. there's this whole layer of stuff at really reasonable prices mm -hmm. in all categories of, of, uh, of music instruments. Yeah. Are, no, that Joyo, those Joyo pedals, they sound great. They're solid. Yep. The only, the only complaint I would have about it is that they don't have a switch, a channel switch. So you can't, like the right. Strymon Iridium, Russ is able to, just like he would on an amp, set up clean and dirty and and switch between them just inside that pedal. That is not right. something that you can do with the, the Joyo. But, you know, you, you could buy two of them for 80 bucks and <laughs> have set, two amps. set up one. And you could set up one for your clean sound to be the Fender and the dirty sound to be the Vox. And, yep. you know, like, uh, that's not so bad. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it's pretty amazing. And, and, uh, how, how well the sound is we have, we have a gig coming up in September and the guys were, we've got another band playing with us and the, the, the guys were saying, Oh, you know, if that band's not on in ears, we're going to have to set up monitors, you know, cause we're doing the sound for this gig. We're going to have to set up monitors for them. And I, of course, in the back of my head, I had already decided we're definitely setting up monitor wedges like this is, the, you know, three of us in in fling. It will be our first gig live with uh, with in ears. There's no way I'm not having a safety net, even if we set up the monitors, tune them and mute them. Like, I want to be able to have them there if those guys start freaking out. So because it is different as as my friend Paul here can can attest. It is different having in ears and so not having that safety net. There's something wonderful about not having that safety net. I'm, yep. I'm, I've been living that way for a long time, at least from behind the drums. I never have a monitor wedge. In fact, I had one at one of the gigs we played that Exeter Fest that we did where the, the guy came and yelled at the sound man. Um, they, they, they had, you know, they had set up the stage sort of traditionally with a monitor wedge back by where the drums would be. And uh, I just muted that because I didn't want all the extra sound um, around me. But um but other than that, I, I haven't had a monitor wedge, you know, anywhere near me in years. And, it, and that's totally fine by me. Uh, <laughs> but but I'm used to it. Like, I, you know, I've I, I'm I'm and I'm OK if something happens to my ears. Like, I know I can get through the rest of the set and mm -hmm. and then and then sort out whatever the heck's going on at that point. You, you know, so but not having any wedge anywhere on stage would probably freak me out a little bit because um, anything can happen, you know. So, but yeah, it's been really interesting. Um, now I got to get the fling guys to go and take advantage of the ultimate ears deal. Cause they're, I, I mean, they, they are using the, the Mackie MP three twenties, um, mm -hmm. as their, as their ears. And everybody's been very happy with the, the mix they're getting with those. They're the universal fits that I've talked about a few times, but, um, but with this deal here, maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe it's time to, to get a couple yep. of the guys into the, the custom fit realm. So, so that's what I got. So there's hope, but I, I think, I think, and I, I know I've said this to you, you, yeah, if you're going to be rehearsing up a new bass player, I would, uh, I would take that opportunity. I would recommend to you to take that opportunity and rehearse with in ears to, uh, to really, to give yourself the opportunity to dial those in, in a non gig environment. No, I get it. And, uh, Nick actually just announced that his Zappa project is kind of pushing him. He would, he would have been the last guy I would have thought would have gone there, but he's, so if he's over the hump, you know, yep. we have a chance. I was shocked that Burke in Fling, our bass player, was willing to go in ears. It, it, like, I just assumed 
he really likes the sound and the feel of, of his bass. And I get that. Like there's, there's a feel to it that is different when th there's no speaker, you know, it literally goes away, but he was like gung ho for it. I, I, I was, it shocked me, but you know, maybe he'd been doing a lot of playing in headphones throughout the, you know, the pandemic and stuff. So maybe that helped him adapt, you know, yeah. in, in a way, I don't know. I, you know, I, <laughs> I didn't spend a lot of time questioning it. Let's be honest. It was like, he's in, he's all in. We're all, all in. Great. Let's make it work. You know, and the guys keep thanking me. They're like, thanks for setting, you know, setting us up and, you know, figuring out, helping us get our mixes right. And it's like, oh no, no, this is definitely self-serving. Like, <laughs> There's no question. Yeah, I am happy to do it. But also it's my way of giving back. Cause my first year of using in-ears, I, I was, I must've been a disaster to the band I was playing and I was playing in, uh, I guess we had changed from the responders to route 66 at that time. It was just at that cusp. And I know I drove those guys crazy trying to deal with my, you know, get my in-ears right and experimenting and figuring it all out. So this is my way of giving back. Um, you know, one, one of the ways I'm happy to give back. So there you go. Yep. All right. That's what I got. You got anything else for today, man? No, it was, okay. uh, it was a lot of stuff today. Yeah. Yeah. interesting stuff too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, we covered a lot of ground chat. we covered a lot of ground yeah thanks for hanging out with us folks feedback at giggabpodcast.com is where you're gonna find us and uh i'm sorry again about your dog my friend hope you have a uh, hope you have an all right week thanks dave always be performing you too thank you